we go. Yeah, so we're, we're still working through our Jesus kept growing wisdom, character and favour. Um, you know, remind us all, we're, we're kind of looking at the Sermon on the Mount with the, through the context of modern well-being, through the context of modern psychology. So just as a quick reminder that the elements that people look at and say this is important for, for your well-being in the modern world, we talk about um, the, uh, the P, E, R, M and A, which I've highlighted there. Um, so, um, so positive emotional attitudes, engagement, um, good quality relationships, meaning, which is the M, and achievement or accomplishment. So just kind of keeping us framed in, in that mindset. Um, each of those kind of elements, <clears throat> they all kind of interlock and they all intersperse. And but of course, as we've touched on in the previous weeks, scripture has an awful lot to say on those sorts of subjects. So it's not surprising that actually by talking out the gospel, sharing it, kind of almost gossiping it, that's the real way in which which the gospel has gone around the world, has been in person to person communication and gossips. Is we think about the big programs, but actually most of the time, um, it's like leaven; it's passed on one to another. Or, or perhaps in a more relevant way in the, in the modern world, like COVID infection, one person to another. And we, and we, as we share our experience, we often find that we're building those quality relationships. We're encouraging people to think more positively, and and that's because that's right at the heart of what Jesus has taught us to do. It's the it's the way that um, the gospel works. So last time we were just um, we were we were picking up the the um, the kind of introduction which Jesus lays out, having given the beatitudes challenged us to reframe the way we see the world and we looked at the importance of that we're going to touch on a little bit of that tonight we're going to see there's a quite significant um, thing about framing in the wrong way if we frame negatively how destructive it is we'll see that emerging in what Jesus says this evening and but last week we were kind of looking at that principle of the of the um the righteous um who are both people people look at your works and they glorify your father but they also persecute you and it's something we didn't. Re- I didn't really say. So some of the things we did touch on, you know, there. Are, um, actually, we all have moral intuitions. We looked at the way people have tried to understand those things, and they're incredibly important that we live out those things to our well-being. Um, it's important that we live by the morals that we we adhere to, and we we think are important. But but because we know um, uh, morality is important, we really desire it in other people. We're often suspicious of it in other people too, which can lead to persecution. We're often hypocritical about it, which is because people don't, and people, that's which is why people don't really trust it, because so many people are hypocritical. But there's nothing hypocritical in having, holding an ideal that's ahead of you. It's only hypocritical when you hold an ideal that's ahead of you, you're not living up to it, but you pretend you are. Um, so so um, it, it, it's not... It, it, the things that Jesus gives us as an ideal, like we're going to be looking at tonight, tomorrow, next week, and so on, we shouldn't be surprised if they're ahead of where we are in truth. Um, so the hypocrisy is only when we try and pretend we are at that place. We're not. <laughs> um, but we also then thought, so people admire and they persecute. Um, just on that that issue, just a kind of a quick thing. Um, whenever you set, there's a kind of an interesting paradox or conundrum, I suppose, is the thing. Is people people object and they persecute you if you are if you're too righteous because they feel condemned. Um, so if if you don't swear, they feel condemned because you do. But the, the, it is the nature of an ideal um, that as soon as you set an ideal, you've set a framework for morality. If I say my ideal is that actually um, sex is supposed to bond a partnership, man to a woman, that should last a whole lifetime and be a a unit for raising a family and children and so on. Um, As soon as I've set that as my ideal, I have, of course, inadvertently created a kind of... um, uh, I've I've created a standard which other people are not living up to, you see. And so they can feel the condemnation... But the flip side is, if we don't have anything that means anything in life, then we don't find purpose. And thinking about that, as we put it up, the um, the elements that make for, up for well-being, meaning is a part of uh, of actually feeling purpose in life. So you can't have purpose and meaning in life without the creation of a system that some people will feel judged by, if I put it that way. So that it's not surprising that, therefore, um, actually, if we're trying to live by those standards, we will receive some persecution at some point and in some context. It's it's the natural it's a natural consequence of pursuing meaning, pursuing a purpose, p- pursuing a meaningful life. 
And so we looked at some of those things last week. Um, tonight, what we're going to do is we're, we're unpacking the verses um, that, that I would relate to the, the beatitude of blessed of the peacemakers, because they'll be called sons of God. And um, that, that's, uh, that little phrase, they'll be called sons of God, is incredibly powerful. I never, you know, if you stop and you think about it, <clears throat> that um, uh, when, uh, when, when Jesus is declared as part of the, the gospel preaching in the ancient world as the son of God, there was a great contrast with the Caesars who had just come. It sort of um, the the idea of, of the emperor, or even the pharaoh before that, uh, being somehow divine had kind of had solidified around this title, son of a god or son of a son of a god, which um, Julius Caesar had been declared a god. Uh, um, Augustus was son of a god, and before him. Um, uh, what you might call it, Alexander the Great, he was a son of a god. <laughs> um, but when they declared that to the listening world that Jesus was son of God, not a god, but son of God, it was actually a statement of how um, a, a kind of it, it contrasted this uh, this carpenter from Galilee with these great military leaders, and yet the carpenter from Galilee had been crucified, victimized, persecuted. It was a very powerful kind of reframing statement in its own way. But here, before any of that has happened, here is Jesus using it, saying, you're like an emperor <laughs> if you're a peacemaker. It's the total opposite of what emperors normally do. They go out and make war. But it's actually it's the peacemakers that I'm going to frame in those ways as calling them sons of God. Um, so just as a quick little thing, I just thought before we kind of get going on the main thing tonight, um, it would be quite nice just to kind of um, throw out um, what you think, the things that you came up from last session that you found particularly helpful or interesting. OK, some people have already got there. That was a very, very fantastic. The petrified forest, Neil. Um, so hopefully, Neil, you weren't thinking I'd love to go and get, grab a piece of that petrified forest <laughs> and uh, be one of those who, who like everybody else. Yeah, the reframing insults um, and turning them into blessings. Yep. Uh, and the power of that, um, I, I can't remember if we touched on it, how much we touched on it, because um, I often, there, there's more than you can say in an evening, but but actually the, the reward idea that is there in heaven is actually um, telling ourselves that something is a reward when we've had to go through something tricky, like a diet, <laughs> um, it is, um, is actually a key way of, of, um, of actually maintaining that sense of, of what I need to keep doing to keep pushing up with this. So it's just really interesting. Um, I, I've um, actually discovered a whole book. It's a secular book, which I haven't read yet, but just on that subject, how um, the use of I, the idea of rewards actually helps you keep going when you need to, to keep pushing through with a habit. And the emphasis on positive rather than negative. Thank you, Joe. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, OK, thank you, Peter. That's really good on the, the way in which as we're unpacking things. That these are aspirations rather than laws. They're they're things that as we set them, as I say, an ideal is always supposed to be ahead of you. If it's not ahead of where you're at, it's not an ideal. <laughs> Um, but equally, therefore, you're always failing against it and you could get depressed if you see it too much in a legalistic way. Um, so let's come let's come back to here. Um, so before we get into the main text of the, our verses, um, I just wanted to highlight something because actually it's part of the brilliant way. I, I mean, I know I keep saying this, but I I am I'm regularly I'm regularly surprised at just how sophisticated the Sermon on the Mount is. You see, we, we've had this whole issue framing things around the fact you will get persecuted. It's almost impossible you won't, even though people like it when you're moral, etc., etc. And then the, the, what Jesus first does um, is if we extend the scope of what we're going to look at, <laughs> we're going to notice the first thing Jesus addresses is sex and aggression, <laughs> Um, or aggression and sex in the kind of the order as it is in Matthew. So we're, we're not going to get on to, because it's part of purity in heart, the, the kind of the sex bit, which we'll look at next week. Um, yeah, so <laughs> so you'll be doing an online... Yeah, that, well, no, I won't go there. <laughs> but but actually, uh, um, uh, it, it, it actually makes Jesus incredibly relevant for all times. Of course, there is... Um, you know, so if you think about how this the, the the next part of the Sermon on the Mount goes, there's this kind of regular pattern. So you've heard it was said previously, and then Jesus quotes the law, okay, 
um, and, and I say to you, and then he actually quotes something as we're going to see this evening is, is part of the current thinking. It's part of the way the rabbis and the, and the council, the Sanhedrin, are talking. Um, and then actually he kind of gives an alternative at the end. So uh, you heard it said, don't murder. And now I'm saying to you this. You heard how it was said, don't commit adultery. And now I'm saying to you this. You see the, the kind of the pattern. Um, so actually over those kind of those verses up to about, I've got it here in front of me. Is it up to about 31, verse 31? Um, you, you've actually kind of, uh, you've got Jesus in very tight way. Because as I said, the Sermon on the Mount is, is an example of the agenda Jesus set, and it's probably the process rather than the, the head knowledge. It's how you process that and internalize it, which is part of the discipleship program he takes on with his disciples, and which they replicate elsewhere, and of which we become a part of. So um, while I'm giving you head knowledge tonight, the more we talk about it and think about it, these things, and we, we start to get a framework on it, it becomes part of the way in which we are being leavened by the agenda of the kingdom, you see. And the agenda of the kingdom does address right up front because it's such a key issue, the issues of sex and aggression. Um, in, in the way it kind of goes, <clears throat> in the 20th century, someone said, I don't know if you've seen the quote, everything is about sex except sex, which is about power. Anybody, anybody remember who said that? Or um, It's often accredited um, to that guy, <laughs> Oscar Wilde, but it's not true. Um, it's actually only about 15 years old as a quote, but it's bounced around on the internet and nobody's quite sure. So you see it kind of a, a associated. But it's a kind of a, an interesting way of summing up in many ways. Um, so it's not actually, wasn't actually Oscar Wilde. It's a kind of a, so that little phrase, everything's about sex, everything's about sex, except sex, which is about power, kind of sums up in one sense the contribution of, uh, of Sigmund Freud. Um it's all sex and aggression, baby. That's how he said it. Well, perhaps he didn't. <laughs> um, but, you know, we talk about the television being dominated by sex and violence because we we are drawn to and we are we are fascinated and we want to stand back and observe from the, that kind of point of view. We, we look at those things. We watch the whole thing and we, we find it it motivates and drives us. Um, but but Sigma Freud wasn't that much of a genius. Um, this is one of his few observations that still stands in terms of modern psychology. Most of his ideas have kind of moved on now. We've kind of gone past, you know, it's not all about me wanting to kill my father, basically. <laughs> Sorry, Sigmund, you're wrong on that. Just He just didn't have a good relationship with his dad, I think. Um, it, so, so most of his ideas have kind of been dropped, but we still kind of recognise the truth of this observation about the dominance role of, of sex and, and aggression. But actually, he was a good two and a half thousand years really too late because you find it, depending on how you understand that that, that, that first chapter of Genesis, whether it is, is original or inserted at a later date. But so over two thousand two and a half thousand years ago, right in the first chapter of Genesis, we get that statement. God creates man in his own image. In God's image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill up the earth which actually has a sex um, component to it. And we can't do it without sex. And, and we've got to remember that we'd, we've been made in God's image. So there's something reflective of the nature of God in this kind of primal drive with us, um, which actually bonds us and multiplies us, if you put it those ways, and subdue it. Now, that you need some aggression if you're going to subdue it. Um, the Hebrew word is has been commented on by Jewish commentators for centuries, and you probably will have heard. It, it's not a kind of an accidental subduing. It's actually something that's kind of deliberately a little bit rebellious. It's something that needs to be tamed. So, so God, to make us in his image, put us in an environment that needed taming. Um, it required subduing, and, and therefore there's something in us that requires some level of aggression to dominate <laughs> And have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, so it, the Bible has placed this kind of primal drives right up front in all of Scripture. And here now, as we come into the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is addressing these primal drives. Um, and he's, he's kind of putting some context into them. Um, and at and, and a very simple level, what he's drawing out is we need to bring if you like, the management of our maturity, our godlike image to those drives. Um, 
that the the, um, the the way that I would often kind of think about it is a bit like um, actually when I was I was taught to drive. Um, had a, my, a friend of mine. He moved to Australia um, as a mechanic. He he ended up as the chief mechanic for Renault. When Renault wanted to get into Australia, they he, he emigrated to Australia. Um, but he um, when he was when he was teaching me to drive, he's a year or so older than me. Um, he did tell me about how because his mum used to used to always go on about um, you know t- complain about his driving when he was learning to drive. Um, so he, on one occasion, he un he unhitched the um, th- the bolts on the driving wheel, the steering wheel, um, and when she started to, to go on again, he stopped at, a, at traffic lights. He just lifted it off and handed it to her and said, "Will you have a go, then, Mum?" <laughs> um, well, I thought it was funny anyway. Um, <laughs> um, but um, but actually, that's a little bit. If you think about it, is the 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 engine power is like a drive. Well, it is a drive. If but if you don't have a steering wheel connected, then you've got a problem. You see. So, so actually, we have this powerful, motivating drive, which actually is is key to so many of the good things in life for us. If you know, family and and so on, and, and accomplishment and achievement and those kinds of things, which are part of 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 our well being, but they do require us to bring the wisdom of our godlikeness to to bear on them, to to direct them, because if they're disconnected from that direction, then we do damage with them. You know. We crash the car and it's a problem. So there are two things that that went in our fallenness can create huge problems. But actually, because in in the gifting of God, they were for us to to to, to have the, the, the have a good and full life with. If you think of it like that. So um, the the rabbis, though, as we look at these things, kind of took these things um, a little bit further. So I'm just going to give some context because you're going to see the whole sex and aggression thing has been picked up. So they kind of understood it because they had the Old Testament. They had Genesis. They understood the need. Um, and the, the, um, the, the Talmuds record a discussion that makes reference to a previous piece of teaching. And as, I, as you look at this, you realize, although it's difficult to be precise as to when this, I, these ideas were taught, it, it looks like Jesus is teaching into a context where they are part of the rabbinic tradition. So as we're going to see as he unpacks these two passages. So just reading the words. What I'm going to quickly do is I'm going to change the view. Let's go to go to here. Okay, so you can see the whole thing. <laughs> so the Bravia Metzia, which is um is a section of the of the Talmuds, it records a discussion about practice in Israel um, by Jews who are now living in Babylon. Um, so um, Abayi said to Rabbi Dimi in the West, i.e. in Israel, I'm not quite sure how that works, but in the, they refer to it as the West. And um, well, it is the West because, yeah, from Babylon to the West, yeah. Uh, with regard to what the mitzvah, the precept, are they particularly vigilant? And this guy replies and says they're vigilant in refraining from humiliating others. Jesus is going to address that, you know, um, getting unduly angry and calling someone a raka, stupid head, you know, those kind of words. Um, they're particularly vigilant about that. So these are the rabbis being particularly vigilant. Um, and as Rabbi Hanina says, everyone descends to Gehenna. So here's interesting because Jesus also talks about your risking Gehenna, you see. So you can see the, the, the joining together of two very kind of key ideas in the words that Jesus is going to say. Um, if I go on, um, everyone descends to Gehenna except for three. Okay, What's he talking about? Oops, hang on, what have I just done there? I've, let's go back here. Um, so the Talmud then continue um, citing a previous debate, which is called the Gemara, which is why we know it's quite old, because it kind of keeps on working its way backwards. And it challenges the assumption that, that it, because that, so the, the it seems that the, the Gemara is kind of saying that, that na- people who call people names risk going to Gehenna. But then it adds something. The Gemara asks, does it enter your mind that everyone descends to Gehenna? So rather say, anyone who descends to Gehenna ultimately ascends. So can you see the actual Jewish concept of Gehenna is perhaps not what we thought, because it looks a little bit more like purgatory. It doesn't mean to say you have to believe in purgatory, but I'm just saying from the rabbi's point of view, the way they taught it, they understood that Gehenna was somewhere that you went because you were they were Israel and they were God's children. They would all get out of it. You see, it's more a kind of purifying fire. So so everyone who descends to Gehenna is ultimately going to ascend, except for the three who descend and don't ascend. So some three classes of people 
go to go into Gehenna and they don't come out. <laughs> There's the one who in in engages in intercourse with a married woman, see? So now we're talking about sex. We've got aggression, or as we're going to say, name calling, uh, as this transgression is a serious offence against God and a person, and the one who hum humiliates another in public and the one who calls another a derogatory name. So those are the ideas that actually over this period where Jesus is going to introduce the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to make reference to things that look very much um, like the teaching of the rabbis, which of course is would would be at this stage dominating um, the, um, the 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 uh, the the temple as well. So so the Sanhedrin that is made reference to the courts are working on this assumption. That probably the worst things you can do are calling people names, and of course, if you're if you're having uh, if you're uh, if you're having um, if you're committing adultery with a married woman, then that's a problem. Now, to give context, we'll do this again a little bit more next week when we get onto this passage. Um, they, the, the, the Talmuds also kind of highlight <laughs> that a woman who's been divorced and not remarried, well, she's kind of fair game. You can you can have sex with her and that's not really, that's that's not adultery. And if she's a slave, and, and there, there are all these kind of reasons as to why you can be immoral, but, but you're not technically committing adultery. It's only when the married woman is married, currently married to someone, um, and that will help us give us a bit of context when we get there. Really all I'm wanting to highlight is that Jesus addresses stuff that is in, he, he addresses the issue of sex and aggression, which comes right from the beginning of Genesis, is, is a key drive in people. Um, the, the, the rabbinic thinkers have thought about it, and they've come up with all sorts of technical rules. They've decided that three lots of people, when they go to Gehenna, never get out. <laughs> They're the only ones who never get out of Gehenna. They're people who call each other names and humiliate each other in public. And there are people who have um, who who um, commit adultery with a woman, but committing adultery is only with a woman who's actually currently married. Is it make all, all making sense? <laughs> um, so you can see that that's framing how Jesus responds to this issue. Um, so um, so now now what I want to do so that that's that's Jesus is clearly um, doing what he's doing because it's a, an important issue. And, and actually it's an important issue in all cultures and societies and um, when when aggression starts running out of hand and when our sexual um, disciplines start to disappear when we when we lose any sense of sexual discipline actually everything goes and everything is meaningless um, it's that kind of a, as we said last time if you don't have standards as to what should be done and everything goes you also don't get much meaning out of it see so I'm going to introduce very quickly. Not we're going to not go to a huge amount with it. What the what we sometimes refer to as the happy hormones. They're, they're not the only ones involved with the, with pleasurable feelings, but they're the main hormones, and because they have something to say on the issue of sex and aggression too. And um, so we we've thought about dopamine. Um, because on week one we thought a little bit about the hope circuit or the seeker circuits. The circuits that that make that create desire. So, so the, the the searching out and desiring after. Well, that that's definitely got something to do with certain people's sexual behaviours. But again, that's not this week. Um, oxytocin um, actually is the more fruitful. It's about taking risks with people. Um, oxytocin is the hormone that makes us. It makes us feel good, um, like dopamine does. It's actually a deeper feeling of feeling good but we it really operates around the areas of our social connections and um, which actually cover both of these areas because that there are damage in social connections um when we when we're falling out with people and being aggressive with them um but potentially also we have the potential with oxytocin of creating good social connections both in terms of our marriage but it's prevalent just in as we learn to trust people and we become part of a community so oxytocin, which is a something that our our brain desires, um, and it 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 desires it, <laughs> um, even subconsciously to us, and we we behave according to it because we want to get these little hits of oxytocin, and um, but but they're very much related to how we relate, not just sexually but just generally. Serotonin, um, which we all know is fundamental to kind of happiness. <laughs> Because that's why if you if you're depressive, you take serotonin um, uh, uptake inhibitors, which keep the serotonin in your in your brain. But it's a incredibly sophisticated. We we're only scratching the surface of understanding how serotonin works. 
But what we do know is it's fundamental to the, to the sense of, of well-being that comes by social status. Um, so sto social status actually um, is important to us. That doesn't mean to be that you have to be at the top of a hierarchy, but you need to have respect. You need to be kind of valued by the community around you. So serotonin is, is one of the ways we get it, is that value. And then I put it over there as endorphins, and um, we probably won't touch on it too much, except to say that endorphins um, uh, make us good about feeling about feeling pain, strangely. <laughs> uh, but sometimes you need to do that. If you're going to work hard, you have to get through some pains. So I just wanted to introduce them because that, that, that we'd, we'll see how they frame things a little bit. Um, you see, in the in the brain, I want to get across just as a, um, we, we don't realise why it is that we, we sometimes do the things we do. But fundamentally, it's because um, the when we start to get a bit, little bits of levels of cortisol in, it's, it's looking to fulfil itself with the kind of the um, the appliance of those happy hormones. If we go back there. Um, there are others as well, but they're quite they're much more minor and specialised. So I've just put the main four up there. Um, so so the, 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 those little levels of stress that can come as soon as the sun comes up and my cortisol level starts to go up, it's motivating my brain, even though I'm not conscious of it. I don't think to myself, oh, I got that. That felt good. We have actually learnt to behave in ways that generate these hormones uh, within our within our bodies and actually satisfy, if you like, the itch of stress. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit more of the the sort of neuroscience as we do. <laughs> so Yak Pronksep is, is very famous. Um, he was sometimes referred to as the rat tickler um, because he actually was the first person to prove the important thing that 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 rats actually laugh, um, which. Uh, <laughs> Um, so um, you can't hear their laughter, but actually he showed it's the same physiological thing that we do. So when when baby rats are rolling around and playing, they are giggling. And he actually learned how to make rats laugh by tickling them <laughs> um, and was able to kind of demonstrate what was happening. And so actually some of our understanding of the role of laughter actually comes from as a side effect of one of his work. But he proposed that, that do you remember I, we looked at the desire circuit? He called it the seeker circuit. It's all about our expectancy that makes us pursue something. We looked at that in the first week. He, he proposed that along, that, that's quite a major one. He, he, he saw then six others, um, anger that he saw as kind of primary circuits in the brain. And I always had a little bit of a struggle with that because I wouldn't, couldn't see why God would exactly make us with anger and fear and panic in our brains if you think of it like that <laughs> um, but I'm just I'm showing you because actually we've moved on but he, he's it's useful to understand it so he, he saw actually people are motivated with anger so it's a kind of a circuit is the way he saw it fear and panic they're like circuits but equally they're they're motivated with care or pleasure which he also or lust the desire side and play and and in one sense dopamine and endorphins start to satisfy those things but they're almost a very animalistic way um the, the oxytocin and serotonin are slightly more sophisticated, as we'll think. They require a little bit more cognitive development in, in the mix. Um, so he put them all down at the kind of right at the base of the brain, that they start from there and they kind of work their way up into the other parts where we feel the emotions. And then we kind of at the, at the higher level where we, we think about, um, we, we label stuff, we use language and words and so on. So he kind of proposed those seven primary process affective systems. And, he, and in doing so, he coined the term affective, um, affective psychology. In other words, the psychology of why I, I do something, create an affect. I am affected by this. And it makes me want to do something. And, but actually, as you look at what he did, <laughs> um, in, in more modern thinking, we've, we've, we've reduced it. So the lady here is a... Um, she, she's a, she she's um, she she's more of a neuro a neurologist. She's a neuroscientist, a neuropsychologist. So she's coming the other way. She's really looking at the top end of the brain, um, and actually one of the things um, she demonstrates and kind of has proved by some of her work is that it's not as simple as as Yap Pronksep kind of indicated. Actually, social constructions, i.e., the things that go on in the top part of the brain. Do you remember when we looked at the rider and the elephant? Um, it's in the rider part of the brain. So I, those abstract ideas actually affect right the way down to the base how we experience certain things. So the, the, the kind of the summation of that is social construction plays a role. Now, 
social construction most of us just know because you you hear the young generation going around go gender's not gender's not real it's just a social construct sex isn't it's, you know biological sex isn't real it's just a social construct um they're pushing the idea to to a ridiculous extreme <laughs> if i can put it that way um but what she's really saying is is the way we interpret at the high level in the brain things that are going on at the base level can make a huge difference to the way in actual fact it affects the way we think and actually that has some relevance to the way Jesus talks about aggression. So in, in her model, which I think is correct and is much more modern and we're kind of moving there, but just see how it works. Um, all those kind of primary process effective systems are actually based on something much simpler and they're interpreted then by our history and our social constructs up here. Um, and so when we're born into a sinful world, we, we add things to this to this system like um, like fear, anger, panic, <laughs> um, and actually you can feel fear, anger, and panic, even though it looks exactly the same um, as, as some other things which we could interpret differently, like excitement <laughs> and uh, and kind of that that sort of what's going to happen anticipation. Um, so there, but so she said that actually really all those things are just part of a negative outward facing effect. Um, and if you think about the play, care, and lust levels, they're really about a positive outward facing effect. And and actually, we know where they originate. We know where those two ideas come from because um, uh, we actually have the the autonomic nervous system, which looks after all of the organs in our body, um, is primarily driven with two main systems. There, there is a third and some other little things as well. Um, but the the big area, the big the big two, are the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And the two systems, I, I sent a little video that you could watch, they, they work at the same time. It's not a kind of a balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic. It's more about that they need to be somehow in step and how they're in step is part of what we learn to feel in our bodies. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system has become hugely associated in popular psychology with the issues of fight or flight. And we think of it as being the, the base level um, um, mental process that we then start to interpret all those negative things out of fear and anger and so on um, are, are, are kind of driven by those but they're, they're not really what they're doing is they are because actually the information um, is all going out of our brain and into our organs in our body but the thing is our brain is also monitoring what happens in the organs in our body so if my heartbeat starts to get faster it might simply be because I'm about to go on a run you know <laughs> Um, but my, my brain is interpreting it and trying to work out with context. And if, if I'm not about to go on a run, it's thinking, why is my heart beating faster? I must be nervous. So it now adds the, the term nervous and that now comes down and it kind of cycles around in our head. And, and that's why some people go to extremes. They, it kind of cycles, cycles, cycles. So this, the, parasympath the sympathetic nervous system we often think of as controlling fight or flight <laughs> The parasympathetic um, has been called lots of different two word kind of ways. I, I, my favorite is broaden and build. So it's true. Um, but often um, the bit that's missing from the sex and aggression story is, you know, sometimes people say it's feed and breed. Um, there are those who are a little bit cruder in their language who, who make it all F's across the board. But I won't I won't say that here. Um, but can you see that? In other words, there's part of the, the, the system that's talking to every organ in my body is talking to it and preparing it for ways that my, my brain will interpret as the need for fight or flight. And if I've got lots of words that are about fight or flight, if I've got lots of models in my in my frontal cortex that are about fighting and aggression, um, that's what I'll do. <laughs> um, and equally, there are, our bodies were getting prepared for relaxation, friendship, um, for mating and for raising a family, the, build, the broaden and build side of things and achievement, accomplishment. And they both kind of work up and go down at the same time. So it, it, it's just kind of really interesting to see that we are wired in a way um, that, that our brains are interpreting and trying to understand on systems that broadly you can see are going to, to, to kind of actually lead us into a place of aggression or ultimately sex. They're kind of the final stages, if that makes sense. But generally it's into action and achieve something or it's into relationships and closeness and actually nurturing and so on. Um, and actually that's hardwired into the body, um, but there is a layer that at the top level is how do we interpret it? What do we do with it? 
and, and that's and and that is if you in like in one sense is modern psychology showing um, the very things that Jesus is addressing do need to be addressed because where we can put we can put models and we can share those ideas and we can s- spread them person to person we're giving tools to the the front part of the brain to kind of actually moderate and bring direction to those drives so hopefully that's that that all has kind of added up and made sense um so i took these slides from um the well-being program so i'm not going to speak too much to what's on though i just wanted to kind of highlight something because we're, we're going to look tonight just at the aggression verses the, the the falling out with people being rude about them calling them names and um, but actually when it, it comes to our sense of value um one of the things we find is that that um, our social status has a clear link with serotonin, which has an important implication for our mental health and well-being, as we said. Um, but actually, uh, um, yeah. So, so because we all want to feel valuable, we all want to 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 feel the flow of serotonin by the actions that we take. <laughs> and um, fundamentally, there are two distinct routes to social status in humans. Um, you either achieve it by dominance or by prestige. Um, so dominance, which is the kind of zero sum game, it means I'm better than you are, and we therefore effectively take value from somebody else. See, um, We can do it in lots of different ways. You can do it physically, you can do it verbally. Um, I wasn't great at winning things um, physically, um, but I, w- I had a very good grasp of language because I had a dad who did lots of public speaking. So I could I could win my battles <laughs> I could win. I could dominate socially by by making people feel stupid by my language, um, which is great until you discover that when they lose at that and they're much stronger than you, they just punch you in the face and give you a fat lip, so you can't use your language, <laughs> can't use your language quite so cleverly anymore. Um, the better way is by prestige, um, which come, which actually again kind of starts to connect us to people and so our status goes up by prestige it actually comes by accomplishment by achievement which as we saw at the beginning is reminded achievement accomplishment is a part of of well-being so um if you're interested in these kinds of levels as we're going through this you probably want to review these things i think they're in the notes sent them through to a um, hopefully you got them but there's some there are various papers on things like dominance and prestige but interesting if you if you self-report in uh, answering questions yourself that actually would indicate that you've got a strong sense of your own dominance um, then you're rated by your peers as probably being you're probably quite athletic and you probably seem to exhibit leadership not necessarily the kind of leadership that we think of as godly but you're also very low in altruism and you're very uncooperative and you're unhelpful ethically and morally. So they, the people look at you and think, well, you're up there, but we don't like you very much. <laughs> um, and actually, one of the things that dominance correlates with, which would make you feel a bit bad if this is the case, is people who have that sense of dominance as part of their self, um, self-reported self identity tend to have low levels of genuine self-esteem. So they often don't feel good about themselves. It's in other words, they're dominating because they can't accomplish um, the prestige layer of social status. They can't do it by their accomplishments. They also have low levels of social acceptance and agreeableness. And they tend to also have um, high levels of self-aggrandizing narcissism, aggression, extroversion, agency and conscientiousness. These are all things that, that, that there are tools for measuring in people. And so you can see those. And it's not that they choose to be that. It's just that there's a high level of correlation so people who tend to to achieve the uh, who tend to use dominance as a way of feeding their value, which we're going to think a little bit about, <laughs> winning every argument, winning every battle, winning every verbal wordplay, getting someone sent to prison. Those kinds of approaches um, are actually just not good for the person. If you look at what's going on in the person, it's it's not good quality. If I could put it that way. Um, Whereas those who actually um, re- report in ways where you can say actually therefore they have a, a strong sense of their own prestige, they're rated by their peers as being very good capable advisors and a different style of leadership. They're leaders in a different way. They tend to be more intellectual. They often are quite athletic and socially skilled, but socially skilled is a key thing. They tend to be altruistic, cooperative, helpful, ethical and moral. So you can see there's something about how we we guess our value not by winning arguments but by having by accomplishing something 
uh, which I, I'm going to see, we're going to see in a bit, sort of frames Jesus's approach to, to being a peacemaker. Prestige correlates with lower levels of aggression and neuroticism, high levels of genuine self-esteem, social acceptance and so on. Um, actually, I've just realised I've, I've been I've been animatedly talking to the screen and I haven't actually got my face on there. <laughs> so let me let me just here you go. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I've just been talking to a talking to a blank screen. Um, so um, well, what was I just saying? Yeah, we, we, we are going to um, that particularly that cooperative, um, socially skilled. You see those words that come with prestige um, because actually the, the, the art of being a peacemaker um, is the art of being socially skilled and cooperative, if you think of it like that. Um, in when they they um, when the term alpha male was studied from watching chimps, um, it wasn't about the biggest and strongest. The biggest and strongest and most dominant was never the leader. <laughs> the alpha male was always the one who was best organised at socially organising things. Um, so so um, we, we use that phrase now to kind of mean somebody who goes around strutting and dominating. But actually, it was originally, as they looked at, at chimps, they recognised that the, the people that, 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 that socially rise and getting the male equivalent of, of prestige, <laughs> if you like, not by dominance, but by, by, um, by doing things well, um, were, the, were the ones who tended to lead the pack. Um, so it's a, a much more productive way. So where are we? Let's come here. So back to the peacemakers. Now, now we're getting on to the actual text of the Sermon on the Mount. So obviously peace is really important from an Old Testament point of view. You know, so you've got, I've just thrown a few verses in. Seek peace and pursue it. Uh, mark the perfect man. See the upright for there's a future for the man of peace. Uh, when a man's way please Yahweh, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Um, there's a. It's interesting that the word peace itself is actually the same word as the as um, uh, as the um, the peace offering. Um, they're actually they're given slightly different Strong's numbers. It comes from Shalem. Shalom comes from Shalem, which means to recompense or restore. And so actually, the word peace offering is just the same word as peace. It, there's an assumption that peace costs something. This is an interesting thought from the Old Testament. Um, but you can see the the Hebrew meaning in in um, yeah, in Jesus' words, when he talks in, in a little bit about making good when there's been offence caused, you've got to make good. There's going to be a cost to you if you're going to put it right. Um, and that and that actually is, we're going to see part of it. So in Jesus' words, what we find is he, he actually agrees, he starts by agreeing both with the kind of the biblical teaching, um, which is putting peace as a high standard, that there's a bit of aggression that's quite natural to us, and also that we should not murder. That's definitely something. <laughs> so you've heard how it said previously, you shall not murder. And whoever shall murder risks judgment. Um, you, you often see things like liable to. But it, it doesn't mean that they get judged. It, it kind of is you're you're in that place where um, and, and actually the word here judgment is is quite broad. It's it, so it's not necessarily really it's it's actually if you. um. Uh, yeah, so so you're risking judgment, but I tell you, uh, sorry, and I tell you, not but, um, and you might be able to make a note of this. I've changed. I did this a couple of weeks ago in a lunchtime Bible study. I did, and I do a translation. This is my my translation, and I put the word but I tell you, but I've now changed it to and because I think it's more in keeping with the flow. And I tell you that anyone who is casually angry with his brother risks judgment. And the reason I put that there is it seems to be that's what the rabbis are now teaching. So it's Jesus is kind of agreeing with them. So we know what it says in the Bible. And the rabbis aren't wrong when they say if, if you're casually angry with your brother, you risk judgment. And even beyond that, again, anyone who says to his brother, you worthless raka, worthless person, risks the Sanhedrin because probably they are embodying this thing. If you kind of call someone a name and anyone says you complacent moron, <laughs> um, I've I've tried to look at the words and and capture something. They don't exactly literally, but they, there's something in the the way they sit in the in the landscape of language that allows me to kind of say you can place. It's kind of laziness, it's foolishness that comes out of laziness. So it's a name. You worthless fool. You worthless empty head. You worthless empty person. Raka is an idea that means emptiness. You empty person. You you complacent moron. Then you're risking the fire of Gehenna, which we've seen already is there in the rabbinic writings. 
if you're someone who goes around doing things like that, if you're saying stuff like that, if you're running somebody down in public and making, uh, making uh, and 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 denigrating them, the 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 rabbis of Jesus' day are saying, therefore, you risk the fires of Gehenna. It's not necessarily eternal judgment, but it's it's something unpleasant. <laughs> So Jesus is kind of not disagreeing with that. That is true. But what we're going to see, he offers a different approach to how you deal with it. Um, and we'll, we'll see. So, so just that idea, though, is from what we've looked at already about the way um, things like fear and so on are structured in us and, um, and so on. Um, alongside that, there are multiple studies that have actually shown that the worst atrocities all start with dehumanizing language. And that might seem like an excessive thing, but it's actually been studied from a physiological point of view. So Jesus is actually two millennia ahead of the science when he understands and recognizes that dehumanizing language is, is the step to doing the most inhuman things. So multiple studies in multiple fields have established a link between dehumanizing language and social indifference, which leads to social violence. Um, and de dehumanizing speech, therefore, is now actually linked as one of eight stages that is watched for by NGOs as a precursor to genocides. So before a genocide happens, there are eight kind of stages. And one of the things, the earliest ones they look for is this is language that is disparaging. So it's not as trivial as it might sound. Oh, no, sticks and stones will hurt, break my bones and names will hurt me. It's not the one off. It's something actually about when you use language in that way, it actually affects us. Um, so I've I've given you an example of a something if you want to go and look at it, there are various ones, deconstructing hate speech in the Democratic Repu Republic of Congo, for instance, um, and actually how the one thing leads to another. And actually, we've we found out a little bit more about how it happens. <laughs> so um, de uh, effectively, dehumanizing languages actually work to turn off our natural empathy. So there's work on schema triggered affect. So we're in the realm that yeah, um, yeah, sep established effective psychology, um, but actually we're now discovering it's a bit more of the modern approach, like Lisa Barrett um, kind of was proposing, where things in the in the cortex, the neocortex, are affecting the way we right the way back down to the the brainstem as to how we feel it. So work on it suggests that some types of affective response accompanies person perception. That's the pa paper. The paper, sorry, is called Social Groups That Elicit Disgust are differently processed in the medial prefrontal cortex. So look at what it's saying. It's saying if there is a group of people that make you feel disgusted, they actually generate that feeling, they are they are processed differently in the front of the brain. And, and how are they processed differently? Um, oh yeah, remember how decisions combine emotion and logic. I threw this diagram up on the first week. And it, in particular, it's in this frontal cortex area so I, I talked about um, the place where the, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is an extension of the white matter of the of the um, of the limbic system. It's kind of interfaces with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is the dark, darker gray matter of the, um, the cortex. Um, the two kind of come together and we, we add emotional context to logical thinking. And that's what it means to be human. We combine the two. The, pre, the medial prefrontal cortex is right there between them. <laughs> um, and it seems that something happens there when we use dehumanizing language. Um, and so what actually happens, I'm putting it um, uh, from the abstract on that paper. Sorry, I go back to this paper. I, the social groups that elicit disgust differently process. The, here's, here's, here's some text from the abstract just to kind of show you. So the model focuses on some ways that people's understanding of another person, i.e. their social cognition, contributes to their feelings about that person. It's impeding the emotional feelings. It's somehow modifying the feelings we have when I think of them, um, when, when I'm, uh, uh, how I understand them affects how I feel about them. Um, the central premise is that social categories enable a rapid effective response to an instance of the category. So what they're saying is that we put people into a group and we will emotively feel um, much, much quicker and easier how we feel about the group. So if someone is a fellow Christian, I will be far more emotionally tolerant of them and, and, and I won't notice their bad behaviour as much 
because I am now predisposed to establish them because I've identified them not as an individual, but by group. That sounds great, <laughs> except that when they're something negative, I don't see anything good about them and I don't actually engage with them as an individual. It enables an effective response, um, a response that doesn't require an attribute by attribute affective response to the instance. In other words, we don't have to notice that they've just told the lie um, or not. We might just overlook it and forgive it because they're part of the group. And I'm really seeing them no, no longer as, as they are, but as a member of a group that I approve of or a group that I disapprove of. Um, I, I won't go through all of the text. You can look at it. So, but basically, it's saying when a person is primarily identified by us as a member of a group rather than as an individual, then we don't have to think of them as an individual with a new, unique responses. So we treat them according to how we feel about the group. And, and this 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 actually has implications all over the place. Um, one of the things that has been was discovered in um, in kind of studies in businesses. <laughs> was that um, people who are assessing um, uh, uh, claimants for insurance um, treat those claimants worse <laughs> because they treat them as a group, as a claimant. So really responsible insurance companies do things like, for instance, they put the, the person's photo um, in so that when you're dealing with their, their case, you're looking at something that makes you identify them not as a group, a claimant, <laughs> And claimants, we don't want to pay if we can help it. <laughs> but actually, I still re I know who you are now. I've seen your face, you see, and I've got now emotional context to you. And it, and by helping that, I actually treat them more fairly, um, which doesn't always work out best for the insurance company, you know. But actually, long term, if they get a reputation, you see, so you want them to treat them fairly. Um, but it all starts with language. <laughs> so back to here she is again, you see, I'm quoting her from another paper. Um, so emotional researchers differentiate between the complex emotions that occur in later cognitive development, i.e. in the front of the brain, and the more basic emotions that start here at the base of the, 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 the head in the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system and basics spin out from there. So we now differentiate between the two. And similar to this distinction, one can argue that some emotions referred to as exclusively social emotions occur only in actual imagined or implied presence of other people. In other words, if, I, if, I've, if I've put the person in a group and I don't see them as a real person, they're a slave, they're a refugee, they're a Frenchman. <laughs> Sorry, that's very rude. But doesn't matter what the group is, if I put them in a group, I don't have to deal with them really as an individual, like when they're sitting next to me. Um, and there are things that you can see in the head that when I try and, and I, I understand and I get told something that's happened to them, if I don't know them as an individual, I just know them as a group. I don't process certain things about them emotionally. It's getting in the way, the way my brain works. Um, so they occur only with actual imagined or implied presence of real other people. Non-exclusive social emotions can occur either in the presence of people or objects. So in actual fact, what we see is, is you stick someone's head in an fMRI scanner and you tell them an emotional story about someone for who them sits in a group. They process that as if the person was a table or a chair. That's just the way we work. It's somehow there's a there's a problem that's got in just because of the use of language. Now, Jesus, of course, puts it. So he said, don't do that. He's agreeing with the kind of rabbis of his day saying, you know, you shouldn't be, you know, you've heard this. You've heard it said, don't commit a mur murder. That's good. You've heard it said that if, you are, if you're blowing off and getting angry, you're, you're liable to judgment. You're liable to the Sanhedrin. This is what they teach. And they say you might be liable to hell. OK, that's all true. But now, Jesus, the context here is unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is going to show them a different way. He's going to approach it differently. Um, we find material on those similar themes, as I mentioned so, so here's Jesus's better solution. So if you're offering a gift at the altar, okay, so offering a gift at the altar, well, one of those offerings is even the peace offering, and there you remember your brother has anything against you. Leave your gift before the altar, go first and work it through with your brother, and then come back and offer your gift. So again, we, we miss the nuance because we're not in the culture, so we don't understand always emotionally. We think we know it in our head, but we don't feel it. See, what he's really saying is if you're the person who's creating the potential for anger, 
if you're offering your gift and you remember your brother is angry with you, could potentially be angry with you. So have you noticed, noticed what Jesus is doing here is saying, you're, you're, don't, don't make him liable for judgment. Don't make him liable for Gehenna. Don't make him liable to the Sanhedrin because he's getting angry because we take a tough line on anger. We don't like it. We know it's got good. That's true. Go and do something to, to take to, to defuse the anger. You see, it's not the obligation of if I've harmed you, I'm going to say sorry. That's different. This is the obligation to say, I don't want to leave you angry with me. And, and actually, if I'm making a peace offering, it's going to cost me to do that. Can you see that? Leave your gift before the altar. Go first and work it through with your brother and then come back. Because now actually we've taken away from him all that possible fearful place of, of blowing off because actually I'm, I'm constantly not paying him back. I'm constantly not doing this. I constantly do this, these things. And he's going to start going around going so and so. That Chris Forster, he's a right stingy git, you know, <laughs> and start speaking badly of me. I'm taking away, do something to diffuse those kind of situations. The, even the situations where it creates um, creates anger, um, it's not about whether you're right or wrong. It's going to diffuse them. Go and sort it out. And actually, that's your peace offering. That's what costs you to bring peace. That's the payment of peace. Because there is a vulnerability in it. Um. So that and that is effectively the acceptable offering. Reach agreement quickly with your accuser while you're still on the same path. Lest the accuser ever hand you over to the judge. I.e. he's got so angry. <laughs> and now actually, but maybe you're getting angry with him. So it's both ways. So if you're if you, if he's got something against you, go and sort it out. If you're on the path and you know that you're getting angry with him, don't go down the route until actually you're you're getting to that place where you want to speak those ways, where you want to get like that. I mean, you end up with the consequences in prison. Certainly, I tell you, you won't get out till you paid the last penny. Hang on. So, <laughs> um, it's kind of drawing this little bit to, 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 together. Um, training the elephant is about this kind of habit forming. And, and effectively, what Jesus has done in in a handful of verses and i i've kind of gone off you know we've looked into the old testament we've looked into the rabbis we've we've looked into the psychology of these things um at, at a really simple level things that seem so trivial because we're calling names and it's not because i called someone a bad name that that's the issue but actually if i get into that habit of categorizing people with a with an insult then he, they become part of the class of people who are insulted so somehow I've got to get into the habit, which is as soon as I'm aware that so-and-so has got something against me, do you know what? For, for the sake of peace, it's not that I can go, I'm fine, I'm all right. I'm not going to put them in that place. I'm going to go and I'm going to, at my cost and my expense and my vulnerability. And interestingly, um, you know, I talked about um, the role of oxytocin as well as serotonin. So serotonin, if I win the argument, I win the debate, I will feel high. I can sit there smugly feeling what a loser that person blew off of me and I and, and they look like a total idiot. Um, I can I can feel superior to people in those ways. But actually, the real thing is is peacemaking is more of a prestige thing. If you can do it, you'll feel good in a totally different way. <laughs> you'll feel it might cost you a bit. And it does, because actually oxytocin, um, which bonds me to people, um, actually is one of the great ways in which it does work is when you have had an argument, which you know in married couples. Married couples, when they reconcile after an argument, actually it goes deeper because what now happens is that the vulnerability of the person who starts to apologise um, solicits a response of oxytocin in the person who, if they can receive the other person making themselves vulnerable in their apology. So there is some vulnerability in those things. And actually, that at that moment, oxytocin doesn't always have to produce good results. Um, oxytocin can also make you behave very jealously, just so you know. But actually, there are, there are these more complicated structures where it, it has these very positive responses, one of which starts with vulnerability. It's taking the initiative to make peace. Taking the initiative to make peace actually creates... Um, it, it, the person who observes you doing it gets a little burst of oxytocin. As you do it, your body will help you to do it by creating a little kickstart of oxytocin. So it goes up in both of you. If the peace is found and you connect, 
you actually find that for a season at least, and sometimes for all of life, because it's often built on these things, you will find a, a strong sense of affection and connection with the person you make that peace with. Um, and so you are now working with those systems that, that, as we've said, need to be shaped, they need to be structured. So training the elephant is about this habit forming. You find ways of putting people you don't like into groups of people that you do like. This, this is just an example. I thought I'll, I'll give you an example. So one of the examples is there, there are people I might feel fearful of or dislike. <laughs> um, it's very easy, for instance, um, to kind of think of folks from another religious group in those kind of ways. Um, so actually trying to find a group that, that if they're going to be in a group, because we do need to be a bit lazy some of the time, we haven't got the energy to treat everyone as a total individual. And, and at a very simple level, I like to try and remember that the, the people's humanity. So rather than thinking, well, this person's a Muslim, is he a terrorist? Is, is, he, is he someone who secretly thinks that Christians should be persecuted in his home country? All those kinds of things, which aren't untrue. But if I put you in that group, then then actually I will stop emotionally feeling for you as a as a person. I will start to feel emotionally for you like a table or a chair, like an object. So I don't want to put you into that label. Even that one doesn't seem that bad, does it? You know, um, there's an interesting bit in Revelation. It's um, I didn't think to use this tonight. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Keeping an eye on the time. Oh, gone a few minutes over, but hopefully you'll, you'll be OK. We won't be too long. Um, I think it's, where is it? I think it's Revelation 3. Is it 3? Um, I can't remember where, where, where the devil is referred to as the, um, the, the Greek word that is used for him for accusing is um is is actually the word that we get the word category from um so in other words the part of the way the enemy does things the devil does things is putting people in boxes putting them in categories losing their individuality by putting them in a box and some of those can seem positive in the end we always want to see the individual but if we're going to put them in a box because we have to here's as a simple habit is try and get into the habit of finding a positive box to put people like that into <laughs> Um, and as I say, for, on a personal level, I find the issue of humanity and I remind myself that humanity is precious. It's made in God's image so that I, I don't see the person which by things that might be true about them. But I don't shorthand them by kind of putting them to a label that I might not feel some more antipathy towards. I'm going to shorthand them by at least putting them into a group that I feel that I know has value. I can put it that way. So even if I'm not totally f treating them as human, I'm at least creating a shortcut to them that is going to treat them better um, put it that way the ideal is to really need, see the person to really see the person and we'll really see the person a little bit when we take those risks when I know that I could potentially be offending them so I take the initiative rather than just rushing off and doing my Christian thing but actually to go and try and reach out to them and try and build that bridge be vulnerable they might respond to it we might build some level of quality relationship I now start to see the individual and that's Jesus's unique solution to this issue of actually I, I know I shouldn't have committed murder everybody knows that I know that the, the the rabbis are saying it's not just murder it's you shouldn't even call people bad names you shouldn't humiliate them publicly you should you'll be you, you're liable to hell if you do that and you're one of those that when they go to hell they won't get out actually that's not true because hell is not a Jewish word Gehenna Gehenna the place of fire um, but uh, but you get what I'm driving at. So my my hope is you've seen it differently a little bit tonight. Not not in the sense of radically differently, but oh, well, that's interesting. I hadn't quite seen all those connections. Um, I only say that because that's how I feel about it. <laughs> so I'm going to just quickly come to to this view. Um, does anyone want to ask anything or or comment anything or clarify anything or say anything? Speak now, or otherwise, I'm gonna <laughs> I'll end the Zoom session. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. I was, very, I was very impressed by the thought that you could um, recategorize people, put people into categories of of those you do like to avoid. Yeah, uh, being. I was very impressed by that. I think that'll stick. <laughs> 
No, well, I, I always think, I, I go try and think all the time, this, this issue of training the elephant is actually often about the habit, that you haven't, got the, you haven't got the mental energy to do it perfectly all the time. So the thing to do is to find this halfway habit and try and make that, make that part of your natural way. And, and, and that, that comment, I'm not trying to sing, blow my own trumpet, but I do find, I, I can think of actual real people I've met um, who sat in a group with, because they, you know, like, um, you know, the Jehovah's Witness or they whatever. And I, and actually, to, uh, I found myself, I, the, the very simple thing I often remember myself, this is a real human being that Jesus loves. So I put them in the category of humanity rather than Jehovah's Witness. Because if I say Jehovah's Witness, it's all those annoying people who turn up the door and don't, don't really know their Bibles properly. You know that, do you, do you see the, see the difference? <laughs> No, thank you, Jill. Any, anyone else want to ask anything or comment? You probably remember the song that Graham Kendrick wrote, Kristen, called Teach Me to Love the Unlovely, O Lord. And it just reminded me when you talked about that, the words in his song, and I'm going back 30, 35, maybe yeah. 40 years, I don't know, but it says, um, teach me to love the unlovely, O Lord. I don't know how to do it. Teach me to love the impossible people I really don't like. I just naturally don't take to some folk. I can't make out the way that they are. I just don't understand other people who just aren't like me at all. I don't know why I remember the words because I haven't sang that song before. Yeah. Years ago, but it reminded me maybe Graham 40 years ago was categorizing people into different groups. Yeah. Maybe he was doing that then. No, no. And it's, it's interesting because I, I so often for me, you know, that it's the final statement that is the really Jesus genius bit. If you say, I mean, it's not the, um, do you know what you're, you know, it's not just murder. You, if you're angry with people, if you called somebody a name, if you called them an idiot once that you're going to hell, which is somehow why we might read it. He's saying, this is the context. This is how seriously we take it. But actually I've got a different way of doing it. If, if you, if you know, someone's got something against you, you're leaving in that place where anger can grow why don't you take the initiative? Why don't you do something? If 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 they weren't winding you up and that's legitimate, or or you've wound them up, you're, while you're on the way, try and sort it out. That's that. Or let it go down that place where we get to the genocides and so on, which all start with dehumanizing language. And and I I think it's absolutely fascinating how we've actually you can actually kind of almost see that where it affects is right at the point where the emotions and abstract concepts come together. Um, it kind of gets in the way but uh, so it's a simple little a, a simple little habit there <laughs> um, which we you know the kind of thing people would probably have tried for millennia without knowing any of the science just because of what Jesus teaches us you know we get into that habit of reminding ourselves I want to see this person the way Jesus sees them not just by my labels you know so we don't have to understand all the science to see to actually reap the benefits of trying to live the way Jesus teaches us. Anyone else like to say anything or ask anything? I was just going to say, I thought it was very interesting. Um, the research you mentioned about dehumanizing language and yeah. you know, the, uh, um, and the sort of stages uh, that as it gets, you know, progressively worse. And, um, you know, the idea that uh, NGOs monitor that, you know, to, to see whether situations are getting more dangerous. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, that's a very um, powerful thing. It'd be, it'd be interesting to read a bit more about what those stages are. They sort of identify. Yeah. I have a feeling when I first put that slide together, I had actually read, I did actually kind of read that little paper. I can't remember. So they may have been in there. So you can always look it up. Um, so actually that would make quite a good slide, wouldn't it? To be honest, <laughs> thinking yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Justin, I, I found it interesting um, about the, the constructs that we create in our minds. Yeah. The social constructs. And, and it's just so, Mind me, the Romans is 12, one isn't it? Be renewed by the transformation of your mind. Your mind, yeah. You're creating the new constructs. Yeah. No, and it, it's um it's really interesting because I, I sometimes do this elsewhere, I haven't touched it on here, but 
So the the um, the abstract part of our brain, the bit that does all the clever thinking, um, apart from where it, it it connects to the emotional center through the um, through the the kind of the crossover of the ventral medial and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, just where I pointed that little thing out. Um, it, it is it is devoid of real emotional context, but but because we're very clever, we we add an, an emotional label to it, but it's all abstract. So that that age old kind of joke, I say it's a joke, it's not necessarily funny, but you see Linus says it, you know, um, I, where he says, um, I love mankind, but there's some people I don't like or something, and Einstein says, um, I love humanity, it's humans I can't stand, you know, but actually because humanity is an abstract concept, you see, so it it sits here. And I can love it up here as a concept when it actually comes to how I'm going to treat the person sitting next to me. It's a totally different part of the brain. <laughs> and, 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 and understanding how the language actually helps to create an insulating layer between because I'm no longer seeing their humanity, which I would treat differently. I'm just seeing them by the group label. It also tells you why in the current way we are, the issue of group identity is actually a very dangerous thing. Um, I'm trying to say that I say that without polit without a, any kind of politics behind it, just that when you start to only see people by their group identity, it, it's an absolute disastrous. Um, it, it's a precursor to disaster. Let's put it that way. So we do have things to worry about in the Western world where we we increasingly talk like that. Yeah, I just added a link to that ten stages of genocide from the genocide watch thing to the chat, so you can yeah. pick that up. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can you, please send it to me as well, but I'll look it up as well. <laughs> Remind me, because I think it would be interesting to make a slide out of it, actually. So, yeah, brilliant. Well, I will, um, if it's okay, I will probably say a goodbye. <laughs> um, so um, I, I've got my tea waiting for me. So I'll, uh, I've got something nice yeah, to look forward to. Thanks, That was great. That was good. Thank brilliant. you. Brilliant. Thanks, good guys. Good. Okay. Good to see you. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.